uh, I'd like to, uh, I'm going to just give people just a, a brief bio of the <laughs> four people that are speaking uh, on this uh, panel discussion today, just to sort of facilitate the smooth running of the session, because we've got quite a bit to get through. And to that end, I'd like to encourage you uh, to keep any questions that you have uh, until the end, when we can um, have a more sort of informal discussion about the things that come up. So the first person that we're really lucky to have uh, speaking to us today is Anne Cunningham. Uh, Anne is a Sydney-based uh, law criminology and academic publisher who has a long-standing, uh, has had a long-standing commitment to social justice hum uh, and human rights and who's been a long-time advocate uh, of independent thought in academic, in the academic and professional sectors. Um, so Anne's going to speak first and actually I think I might introduce people, we'll introduce people then as we go along. So right. yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, thanks, sure. Dan. Okay, um, thanks. And we've got a fantastic group of people speaking today. We've Max Lane, Australia's preeminent Indonesia expert, Jeff Sparrow, who many of you will know um, through his uh, outstanding writing work, and Tom Bramble as well. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what they have to say. So I'll try and be fairly brief. Um, what we're here to talk about today is what is never talked about. And it's what you don't see in bookshops or on academic course reading lists or commented on in the media, media. It isn't about what is critiqued or reviewed or discussed or discussed in learned or scholarly sense, but what simply doesn't appear. What we don't see matters as much as what we do see. Censorship by omission, which is what I'm speaking about, is a form of covert social control. Censorship, including self-censoring, is often understood, I think, as something unequivocally overt, something that is imposed on us and to which we react, such as book, book banning. This is reinforced by the state and by social influences such as religion. But censorship by omission is what is avoided, discarded, deleted, obscured or prevented from publication by those with the very means to ensure its dissemination. When we travel internationally and we go to places all over the world, South Africa, India, the United States, anywhere, a lot of terms like Marxism aren't a problem. They're not a problem for people. Some people reject them, but they're not a problem. Here, they're just never heard. In Australia, there is a set of perpetual rules in place, uh, I think, in much academic writing and publishing and serious nonfiction publishing. There's no class analysis, there's no advocacy, there's no revolutionary change potential. There's no challenge to orthodoxy. These are perpetual rules. <laughs> in terms of the critical social sciences, I see scores of book proposals in a year that simply do not mention class or use class as a useful tool of analysis or for understanding social circumstances. I'm not even suggesting here that every author has to use it for any particular political stance on class. They just don't use it. They don't reference it. It just doesn't appear. And that's really lacking. That is censorship by omission. <clears throat> in this, my own sphere, I call it the big fudge, censorship by omission in academic publishing. And that's what I initially pitched this panel as. Do publishers, commentators and academics effectively censor by this omission the critical social sciences? That is, they ignore, reject and silence thoughtful, intelligent research, book proposals, scholarly, any scholarly work at all, that collide with their own often liberal views and the prevailing academic wisdom. This affects all non-fiction publishing or at least books that take themselves seriously. So I'm going wider than just the academic sphere. Just think about any books of comment. Liberal voices who control most media, most publishing and the greater part of the Australian Academy may raise vociferous protest against overt acts of censorship such as Bill Henson's photographs being banned in 2008 and 2010, yet they effectively promote and endorse censorship by omission, the covert form. We have little problem accepting that the mainstream media practices this kind of censorship in their editorial focus or in promoting public relations-driven news at the expense of real investigation. But we give a kind of exemption from censorship to what is really allegedly more contemplative and should be more honest practice, which is serious non-fiction books and writing. Now, again, we're lucky we've got three people here today who <laughs> are outside of that, which is great. But this is intellectually baffling, because what you get in societies which sense the biomission is a kind of dull tedium promoted as culture and the marginalising of those who stand outside the mainstream. 
This is too often a result of lazy thinking and lazy publishing practice. I'll give a couple of specific examples. Why, for instance, is Marxism 2013, this conference of ideas, not discussed or promoted as widely, earnestly and seriously as an event, say, at the Wheeler Centre or at Sydney's Festival of Dangerous Ideas? Why is it marginalised? We're not marginal, except in the best way, of course. Why is every airport, library and most bookshops stuffed full of military and military history? too often by academics, when readers could and should be offered something from the really bursting Australian archive of diversity history, of class, gender, race, sexuality, disability, other struggles for rights and equality. It's exciting and it's rich and it's not published. The promotion of military history to become all dominant was eloquently explained by Henry Reynolds and Marilyn Lake in What's Wrong with Anzac a couple of years ago. That is, the systematic promotion of militarism across Australian society and academia from the mid-1990s was deliberate, and it was encouraged by research grants, stipends, and more. It suited many publishers because genre non-fiction is as easy and cheap to market as genre fiction. They embraced the new militarism just as the liberal press and media embedded Australian journalists with our mercenaries and their imperial warlords and allies in the latest colonial war. It isn't any different. But those bursting shelves of increasingly obscure daring do, I mean, they're really scraping the barrel at the moment if you look around, but also desperate privation and destruction are powerful reminders of censorship by omission. But it's up to us, those of us working in the creative and academic spheres, to challenge orthodoxy when it censors, not to merely cri critically discuss it as Henry Reynolds and Marilyn Lake did. I mean, we're lucky to have on the panel some remarkable writers thinkers, academics and publishers who do challenge the status quo, who don't sense the biomission and who call their peers to account. They have much to share about the history of censorship. But what we get to read, for instance, Max Lane on Indonesia, <coughs> talks about Indonesia and the current state of academic life and Jeff Sparrow on the history and background to it in Australia. But before then, I want to just make a couple last comments about publishing. Too many Australian publishers basically act as cultural gatekeepers of the liberal and neoliberal orthodoxy. Too many effectively censor what books the public will get to read. Not but just by choosing what to publish, it is what for them a buyer's market. You get many more proposals than you can ever publish. But by you can do it in other ways. You do it by publicity and promotion budgets. You allocate one book $20,000 and the other book $500. By the terms of trade you offer, by the price point you offer, by the print run, and there are any other number of ways to inflate or diminish a book's success. Anyone who's a writer here will know that. Anyone who's a publisher knows it as well. But of course these publishers, no one tells them what to think. They don't have to. It's pretty easy, actually. Most books don't make money. And this law of average is to reject about 80% of proposals on the basic absence of commercial viability. You actually do not need another reason. But what always amazes me, and the feedback I get from authors, is the need from publishers, the publisher I work for does it, some of the publishers, other publishers do it, some of the most well-known academic publishers do it, is the need to specifically condemn and confront those who reference class or use basic useful terms <coughs> such as Marxism. Like, we don't do that kind of book, or that kind of book doesn't sell. This is just nonsense. Few serious books sell without a substantial five-figure publicity campaign or a textbook adoption. That's a fact in Australia. But my experience as a publisher and as a bookseller is that those books which engage with original ideas and reject the bleating yawps of liberalism actually sell better. <laughs> in addition, too many of the bland that are currently being published in both in terms of research, scholarly research, and in terms of serious non-fiction are directly or indirectly sponsored by corporate and mining interests. This is what Professor John Braithwaite at ANU and Kerry Carrington at QUT have essentially called the underbelly of authoritarian capitalism, and it's a fact. There are, of course, many honourable exceptions across academic disciplines. I think criminology and criminologists come to mind where class is central. But even there, you get a sort of false sectarian divide between those who, in essence, represent a line of imposed control, that's the government line, over society and those who then are identified as critical criminologists. Um, that is, those who dare to question orthodoxy. Again, they're marginalised. In law publishing, the situation is worse. I asked one eminent law professor who wrote a terrific short book. 
Oh, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> um, yep. Okay. Um, who wrote a terrific short book, which rather than sourcing the Australian Constitution as a rights document, actually sourced and found much of it came from the rise of private property law in the 19th century. Now, I asked him why we didn't see more of this kind of polemic from senior legal academics. I mean, they're protected. They can do it. And he just laughed and said, well, you don't get appointed to many important government inquiries if they think you might rock the boat. Mm -hmm. If you can't guarantee your obedience to orthodoxy, then you don't get that. You don't get those nice little sidelines which are quite lucrative. It's a censorship by omission. Again, why don't more legal experts speak out on Palestine? They do privately. They know the truth about Palestine. But I can think of only two professors, Ben Saul at Sydney and Geoffrey Lindell at Melbourne and Adelaide, who regularly do so. This is really shaming. So that's just a couple of examples. What should be done? As publishers, we need to continue to stand up whenever censorship beckons or the state acts against free speech, any kind of free speech. What we want is more publishing, not just publishing that is authorised or sanctioned by the state and its agents, and censorship by omission is exactly that kind of sanctioning by the state, even when it's not acknowledged. We also need to encourage writers and academics to not censor their work through omission. We need to be disobedient and we need to break the rules and we need to forget about focusing on the spells of individual achievement in our careers. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, well, that's a great note to end on disobedience and rule breaking because we've got a few more disobedient rule breakers uh, coming up next. And the next person um, that I'd like to introduce is Jeff uh, Sparrow. Uh, Jeff may be known to some of you. He's an Australian uh, left-wing author. He's currently the editor of Over, uh, Overland Literary Journal. He is the co-author of two volumes of a history, a radical history of Melbourne. Uh, he is the author of this fine book, uh, Communism, A Love Story. He has recently edited this collection of left-wing uh, essays called Left Turn. These books, by the way, are available on our bookstore, at our bookstore, uh, with Anthony Lonstein, who's also currently speaking on another panel uh, about Palestine, uh, so uh, and is now the recently the the author of a new book called Money Shot: uh, A Journey into Porn and Censorship. So he knows a thing or two about censorship. So I'm going to get Jeff to uh, take it away. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, thanks for that. I actually thought you were going to say he knows a thing or two about porn. <laughs> well, <laughs> presumably that now. too. <laughs> um, where do I? Oh, do you want to come around here? Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. Um, well, agreeing with um, most of the points that Anne just made, I think I would disagree um, with the terminology uh, that we put forward. And so maybe we can have a discussion about this at, at, um, if we get a discussion period um, at the end. I don't like the term censorship by omission, because I think the difficulty with it is it runs the risk of conflating what happens in, say, a traditional military dictatorship with the kind of process that, say, Chomsky outlines in his book Manufacturing Consent, which is how ideas are, um, are prevented from reaching the mainstream in a liberal <coughs> democracy. And these are quite different processes and need to be understood in their specificity if we're going to defeat them. So if we define censorship as state repression to prevent the dissemination or circulation of ideas. And I think we need to define it this way, otherwise the term becomes so broad as to be almost meaningless. If we define it in this way, the problem with talking about censorship in magazine publishing in Australia is there really isn't much. I've been editing Overland for about um, six years. I've been involved in its, its publication for about 15 years. And in that time, I've never encountered state censorship as a serious phenomenon. The publishing industry in Australia has 99 problems, as they say, but censorship, state censorship is not very high up on them. In fact, I was trying to think of current censorship controversies in the publishing industry, and the only one that came to mind is Quadrant, the right-wing journal is currently running around complaining that it's been censored because it didn't get as much money from the Australia Council <laughs> as it usually does, to which there are two obvious responses. Firstly, this is not censorship, not simply getting the grant that you applied for is not censorship. And secondly, cry me a fucking river. <laughs> <laughs> so you can find examples of censorship around. I mean, someone, someone mentioned before the Henson case with Art Monthly and their, their, their cover. There have been a couple of jihadi books 
publications that have been um, censored. But actually, the really interesting story about censorship in the um, literary industry is actually a story of decline. Because if you think back to Australia in the 20th century, Australia had a reputation of being one of the most censorious countries anywhere in the world. And a great majority of the censorship was specifically directed at literary texts. If anyone's read Nicole Moore's really interesting book, The Censor's Library, the conceit of that title, this notion of the Census Library, comes from Nicole's discovery of the archives, where all the books that had been seized over that period were being kept. And quite literally, you could run a university course on the history of Anglo-American modernism <laughs> purely from the books. I mean, it's not an exaggeration. Purely from the books prevented from being published in Australia, from James Joyce um, to, to, to Philip Roth. Now, these books were banned because sometimes for political, um, political reasons, particularly in the 20s and the 30s, sometimes for offending religious sensibilities, but overwhelmingly because they were judged to be obscene, that is, the, the sexual content that they contained. Okay, think about the publishing industry today. What was the biggest selling book last year? Of course, it was Fifty Shades of Grey. Mm -hmm. And this is a really, really interesting development. You know, it's not that simply that this is a book written to sexually titillate its readers, the traditional definition of um, pornography, but this is a book exclusively devoted to a discussion of bondage. And if you go back to the development of the classification code in Australia, when it's recodified in the 1980s, which is still the basis of the current code, bondage is listed as such a... Uh, so a practice so beyond the pale that any X-rated movie that contains bondage in Australia, and this is still the case under the law, must be refused classification. By, by law, it must be refused classification. So here we have the instance of a book that's solely about bondage, and yet it's being read on every tram, on every train. People are giving it to their parents for, for, for Christmas <laughs> and, um, and all the rest of it. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very, very significant change, particularly when you think about the impact of that particular title on the industry. It wasn't simply the biggest book that sold in Australia that year. It's the biggest single book in Australian publishing history ever. It was responsible for 25% of the fiction sales in America for one year. Single-handedly responsible for restoring the corporate fortunes of Barnes & Noble. Every publisher in Australia wants to get their own um, Fifty Shades uh, uh, of Grey. So if we're talking about obscenity and censorship laws, I think we have to recognise that something really significant has changed. How do we explain this, this change? Well, I think that there are four interrelated factors, and I know we're very short of time, so I'm going to have to charge through these like a, a bull at a gate, but again, we might be able to come back to them in discussion. The first one is, of course, that there were campaigns that beat back censorship in Australia. Again, that's why I don't like the term censorship by omission, because I think it's really important in a time when we don't win too many victories to recognise that actually some victories were won about literary censorship in Australia. If today people won't accept cops going into readings to, to seize books, it's because that when this happened in the past, there were major campaigns about them and they were largely successful. Remember, it's not that long ago, back in 1945, in the lovely Sailor case, that Robert Close was taken from a court in handcuffs for publishing a book that contained the word fuck. In fact, not even the word fuck. I think it was a euphemism. It was frug or thug or something like that. But he went to jail for that. And if that doesn't happen to us today, that's because that, camp that, um, that right to discuss frankly, sexuality and other issues has been won. I think that's important to remember. Not completely, there are anomalies and all the rest of it, but there's a significant step forward. The second um, development is that the uh, nature of um, the nature of literature has changed quite significantly. <coughs> that um, once upon a time, well, any, any, any time that uh, you have a, 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 a censorship case in Australia in recent times, the, question that comes up immediately is, is this book art or is this book porn? And that's because this is coded into the DNA of the old censorship laws from the 19th century. This notion, this distinction between high culture and, and, and low culture, that uh, high culture is elevated and to do with morality and to do with improving people and all the rest of it. Low culture is to do with mucky, dirty topics about you know, sexuality and... Uh, 
and uh, scatology and all the rest of it. But of course, if you think of the evolution of literature and most uh, modernist art during the 20th century, what happens during that time is these distinctions become fundamentally complicated as serious literary writers begin to assert the, the, the right and the duty of the artist to delve into the bedroom and the bathroom and other aspects of human um, human behaviour. And what's more, they increasingly take on uh, lower modes when they're doing so. So serious literary writers begin to explore science fiction, romance, and even pornography itself. To the extent now that if you are really looking for disturbing books about sexuality, you are far more likely to find them amongst prize-winning literary novels than you are amongst sort of trade novels, which tend to be very, very conservative on these things. So there's a fundamental shift in the nature of literature and art that makes the old censorship code no longer kind of workable in the, in the same way. Thirdly, there's a, um, a shift in the status of literature as a whole. That is, through most of the 20th century, in, in, the, in the wake of F.R. Levis, um, making the argument that with the collapse of religion, literature can play this important role in holding society together. It can elevate people, it can teach them right thinking and right behaviour and all the rest of it. Through most of the 20th century, literature might not have been a mass phenomenon, but was considered incredibly culturally significant to the nation. And that's why censorship was so important to the state, because this substitute for religion had to be monitored and, it, and its borders policed. Today, nobody believes that. That, that, that notion of literature acting in that way has collapsed and by and large um, society now treats uh, literature, serious non-fiction, as um, one entertainment option amongst others. Um, in fact, when I interviewed Donald McDonald from the Censor the Classification Board, he essentially said this to me. He said, well, you know, like um, the people who uh, buy and read literature in Australia, well, they can largely take care of themselves. Actually, most of the censorship cases that happen now happen in respect of mass phenomena like film or video games. That the, the, the readership for um, literature and serious non and non-fiction in Australia is very, very small. That then moves us to the fourth point, which I think is really significant um, a, as well, and this is to do with the uh, cultural shift, the cultural and economic shift that goes under the rubric of neoliberalism. Now, books have always been commodities, yet through most of the 20th century, they were to an extent protected from market forces. Most publishers would put at their front list serious literary titles because they saw that they were important, or that they were cultural significant, culturally significant, or they gave luster to the company, and they would subsidise them with their trade books. You know, you think of Faber and Faber employing T.S. Eliot as a commissioning editor, not because he was going to bring in the bestsellers, because he was seen as somebody who would, you know, be able to pick serious literary works. From about the mid-1990s, this stops happening. So rather than literary texts being subsidised by, uh, you know, cookbooks or sports diaries or whatever, increasingly they're expected to compete against them. As the notion of the market as being not only the most efficient way of regulating human society, but the only way to regulate human society is introduced into every aspect of life. And the ramifications of this for censorship are really, really profound. Yes, okay. Are really, really profound. I mean, if you think about it, the, the old notion of um, censoring obscenity is based on the notion that pleasure, illicit pleasure, must be regulated, must be limited. Once you move into a totally marketized society where the citizen is reinvented as a consumer, the prime goal of the citizen is to consume, you're shifting away from a model of pleasure as something to be regulated, from pleasure that is some, pleasure becoming something that is compulsory. That, that, that um, literature, like any other commodity, must circulate. And increasingly, for uh, neoliberals, um, any interference with the market becomes anathema. And you can see how this plays out in censorship in Australia. The board responsible for making these decisions used to be called the censorship board. It's now called the classification board. And when I spoke to them about that, the reason why it's called that is they say, we don't censor, we classify. Now, this is disingenuous in many ways, but what they're pointing, they see themselves as essentially offering consumer advice as to what product you're going to choose, whether you would like a G-rated cartoon or whether you would like an X-rated porn movie. And this notion of offering consumer um, advice, even this is challenged by the hardcore neoliberals. I don't know if people saw the, the IPA document that's been circulating, offering all this advice to um, 
to, to the, the incoming Liberal government as to what they should do, one of the things that they're calling for is the total abolition of the classification system um, in Australia. Because for neoliberals, commodities must circulate. Now, very, very quickly, I know I'm pushing the, the, the time limit. I don't want to suggest that there is no censorship in Australia, but I think we have to understand the way it works now. And the best example of this is to look to the Northern Territory in Australia. People might know in the Northern Territory traditionally has had the laxest classification laws anywhere in Australia. Well, any Canberra has one, the Northern Territory has has the other. In the Northern Territory today, there are some parts of the Territory where the censorship laws are incredibly lax, incredibly liberal. These are the white areas. There are some parts where the classification laws are incredibly strict. These are the black areas. This is a response of the Northern Territory intervention, which it's not often realised, but contains incredibly draconian censorship laws pervading to porn. People might remember the outcry about Conroy introducing an internet filter. This was introduced in the Northern Territory. But uh, in most Indigenous areas, all computers that the Indigenous people have access to are now filtered. It's received almost no attention whatsoever. So incredibly draconian censorship laws. Those big blue signs outside every township saying, you know, no alcohol, um, no porn. Okay, why does this take place? The, the Northern Territory intervention is the quintessential neoliberal policy. It's explicitly about introducing market forces into Indigenous life. And, you know, if you read the documents, again, I think I'm running out of time. Yep. I don't have time to go <laughs> into this, but it's clearly about trying to marketise Indigenous life. So you might think then that introducing, um, that allowing porn to circulate, yeah, okay, would be, um, would be acceptable to the Royal Territory Intervention. But, of course, it's not. And that's because while neoliberalism might be against state intervention in the market, it's fundamentally in favour of state intervention when it's necessary to extend the market or to defend the market. And that's what the Northern Territory intervention is about. The anti-porn laws there are partly because they offer more coercive powers to the police and partly because they're intended as a conscious humiliation to break down Aboriginal resistance. Um, this, I think, is the changing shape of censorship today. I would talk about what that actually means for literary writers but I think I'll be in trouble if I do so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we've already got some uh, quite different ideas and themes uh, flowing through uh, the, these, uh, the speaker's talks. So I want to make sure that there's enough time for discussion to, to thrash some of these things out. So I'm going to discipline the next two speakers um, quite seriously. Uh, but I'd like to introduce Max next. Um, Max Lane is a longtime socialist uh, and activist and has written extensively on Indonesia. Um, he's translated uh, some award-winning uh, Indonesian novels. He's been active around third world uh, development issues. He was a radical at uh, Sydney University in the 60s and 70s, so we've been imbibing some of that spirit in the last couple of weeks in our battle with management at Sydney University and the strike uh, that's been that's sort of ongoing there. He joined the Socialist Workers' Party uh, in Australia uh, and then later the DSP uh, in 1981. And uh, during the 90s, he was the coordinator uh, of Action in Solidarity with Indonesian and East uh, with Indonesia and East Timor. He is now very happily uh, a member, or we're very happy to say he's a member of Socialist <laughs> Alternative. Uh, hopefully he's happy about it as well. So, um, Max, uh, we welcome you to come up and speak to me. <laughs> Well, I am, I am as uh, given the emphasis in the in introduction, yes, I am going to be using as an example of discussion of the question of censorship, uh, writing and publishing about Indonesia in Australia. A part of this is because I personally am interested in Indonesia, but there's another part of Australian society which has shown enormous interest in Indonesia. Uh, it's not actually the Australian left or the organised section of the Australian working class, it's the Australian ruling class, who for decades have given it high priority. From the time the Chifley Labor government agreed to put 700 anti-colonial left-wing nationalists in prison in Cowra on behalf of the Dutch colonial government, to a more positive side when the Australian government agreed to be the Indonesian Republic's representative on the committee negotiating with the United Nations for its independence, 
back to a more negative side when the Australian government sent arms and equipment to right-wing rebellions in the, in the late 1950s, which were also supported by the United States, to sending soldiers to Borneo to fight Indonesian troops who were supporting uh, guerrillas in Sabah and Sarawak fighting for the independence, to the assistance given to the Indonesian government in 1965 under General Sohato when he carried out over a three-year period the extermination of almost one million people, which, it, which was responded to by Prime Minister Harold Holt at the time as if one million Reds are dead, something good must have happened. Mm. Through to the support for the Indonesian government's invasion of East Timor, which took the lives of one third of the East Timorese population, and which included not only diplomatic support for that invasion, but supplying arms and equipment for a long period of time. So certainly the ruling class <coughs> has had a big interest in <coughs> Indonesia over the last extended period. One of the interesting things was that during the peri a period of time where not only the ruling class but the Australian public became increasingly interested in this issue was after the 1991 Dili massacre. It became an international event John Pilger's film, actually, about that massacre also helped uh, increase Australian awareness about it. Indonesia became, Indonesia and the Indonesian occupation of East Timor became an item very close to the top of the public political agenda in Australia from 1990 on, 1991 onwards. And I often ask my academic friends, I'm now academic, but I've only been a full-time academic now for one year. <laughs> I asked my academic friends, <clears throat> how come during the 1990s there is not one book published by an academic specialist on Indonesia <laughs> trying to make even one explanation of any, co of any political colour to the Australian community about what was happening in Indonesia and this thing? Not one let alone one which was aimed at explaining to the Australian community the repressive and exploitative character of the Indonesian regime. Not one. Despite the fact that around the world, Australia has been considered a centre for academic Indonesian studies. The books that people did read, people from the sort of book-reading sector of society, the books they did read were written by journalists. Not particularly outstanding books, but they were written and published. Books by Adam Schwartz, for example, probably the most widely read one. But by academics in Australian universities, zero. There was an attempt to bring some alternative information to the Australian community to the extent resources allowed when a few of us in the early 1980s set up a magazine called Inside Indonesia. What was the academic involvement in that? One or two sympathisers around the edges, otherwise zero. Activists around East Timor provided the bulk of the energy to set up inside Indonesia. And when things came really hot in the 1990s, and some of us wanted to align ourselves openly and strongly in support of the anti-dictatorship movement, those of us who wanted to do that found ourselves all of a sudden without any consultation, no longer listed on the editorial board of Inside Indonesia, such as myself, for example. Mm -hmm. Of course, during the 1990s, if you read about it, everyone talked about the Indonesia lobby based in Australian National University supporting Australian government policy. But Sahata went in 1998. That's 14 years ago. What about now? There are still no books written by academics aimed at broader reading community. The books they published are their PhD theses, published by Rutledge, sold at $150, mm -hmm. aimed at other academics and students who choose that specialization. <clears throat> this one, one book by one academic who I have some admiration for, Adrian Vickers, on a, looking at Bali, giving people going to Bali a different perspective 
and he's written a textbook which, at least in the first chapters, I think has a bit more criticalness, although in the, the more it gets, reaches the contemporary period, the more conservative it becomes. Inside Indonesia still continues. Sometimes I use articles from it to give to my students in class, mainly because they're short articles and it's difficult to get students to read long <laughs> articles these days because of the way the education system's been neoliberalised. Mm. But I want to try and... I want to read you something which I think gives a very good picture of what the mentality is amongst academics working on Indonesia today. In John Pilger's speech yesterday, he referred to his discussion with a German filmmaker and the existence of a thing she called the submissive void, which I think still exists in Australia, which we have to acknowledge is what we have to attack to the extent exists amongst the working class or ordinary people. But in the university sector, it's not a submissive void. It's a submissive, hypocritical mush. <laughs> It's worth a void, at least, you have a chance of awaking and putting something in it. I'm afraid that the hypocritical submissive mush actually requires destruction rather than simply awakening. This is from an article in this book, Knowing Indonesia, just published. It's by Professor Edward Aspinall, who used to be a member of the Democratic Socialist Party. I Embarrassed to say. He's now a professor of political and social change at Australian National University. And he wrote, in, he wrote this article, The Politics of the Study of Indonesian Politics in Australia. I just read it slightly long, but I think it really captures for you what's, what the thinking is. He's describing the, the viewpoints that exist in the different schools of thought in Australian, in Australian study of uh, Indonesian politics, it, including the group that he belongs to himself. Now, the left-right axis that once divided Indonesian studies has largely faded. The Cold War has ended. Democratization has taken away much of the passion about how academics should best position themselves and their work vis-a-vis -vis the Indonesian regime. Equally important, the Marxist project for remaking capitalist societies that underlay many of the radical critiques of mainstream analysis of Indonesian politics has also been eviscerated. In its place has come a post-1960s leftish sensibility that combines celebration of difference, identity and multiplicity with a liberal sympathy for democracy and human rights, which, as I have tried to outline above, permeates the Indonesian studies field. Evidence of this transformation is found, ironically, in the one place where there has been anything approaching a coherent neo-Marxist school of analysis of Indonesia in Australia, in the work of Richard Robertson and that group of scholars that he has trained and been associated with with the chief of the Indonesia scholars among them, Vedi R. Hadis. Robinson and Hadis make use of the tools bequeathed by Marxism to devastating effect, whether in portraying the class dynamics at the heart of the New Order regime or in portraying the continuities in the oligarchic power in post-transition Indonesia. Yet, the gulf between their analysis and those of the other scholars of Indonesian politics is much narrower than it might appear. With an emphasis on elite dominance and recalcitrance being a widely accepted theme in studies of post Suharto democratization. If anything, they are distinguished chiefly by their pessimism about the prospects of Indonesia's democratic transformation. A pessimism that derives from the absence in their analysis of the belief in revolutionary change and the transformative potential of, of subordinated groups that once animated left-wing scholarship. So the viewpoint is, you're pessimistic about democratization because elites are recalcitrant and subordinated groups, i.e. the mass of the population, have no potential for transformative change. 
It's the end of history. It's, it, it's the end. And I think that sort of also explains how can they write anything of interesting to anybody <laughs> when that's the general framework. They're sympathetic to social justice. They have a leftish sensibility <laughs> to pluralism and multiplicity. But they don't think elites shift and they don't think subordinated groups have the potential for transformative change. They're pessimistic, which means, in fact, they don't have any analytical or theoretical framework at all that they're willing to admit to. A scientific approach is, if your theory and analysis tells you something's possible, and if you use a Marxist theory and analysis, it tells you that revolution is possible. It doesn't tell you that it's easy or that's going to happen next week or next year, but it tells you it's possible. And if, you're a, if you have a scientific attitude, when your theory shows you something is possible, you struggle to achieve what's possible. There's no optimism and pessimism in the scientific approach. There's what's possible, and you make a decision also what's not possible. If you think what's, something is possible, even if you don't yet have the equipment to carry it out, you struggle to find a way. It seems to me that <laughs> these people who now also continue to control inside Indonesia magazine, and you can find many nice articles in it, which are very sensi which have high levels of sensibility with trade union struggles or high levels of showing their sensibility towards gender equality struggles. But there is indeed, as he indicates, no sense of the real possibility of change. I went to a seminar which was I found very disappointing last week. I actually organised it. Uh, academic from uh, ANU I invited invited down to give a talk on a, what I, what I consider a very interesting and powerful film. Especially has a powerful impact I think in Indonesia as Indonesian watchers a, a film called The Act of Killing. But he opened his seminar. He opened his seminar with a first point, you know, PowerPoint projection. First point, I think the struggle for justice for victims of the mass killings and arrests in 1965 is proving more and more difficult. I am pessimistic. That's how he opened. That seems to be the mentality. If, if that's your starting point, what is the point? If that's your starting point, what is the point? It's just masturbatory. And it's not going to produce books. The absence of books that actually play a genuinely critical, radical, educatory role for the Australian community is indeed, in the Indonesian case, not a result of state repression, state censorship. It's a result of something worse, deeply ingrained self-censorship. It's worse and harder to deal with. And I think in the academe, this submissive, hypocritical mush void is going to have to see an escalated level of animosity towards it from us. Thanks, Max. Okay, our last speaker is Tom Bramble. Tom has been a member of Socialist Alternative for a really long time. He uh, is on the national executive uh, of Socialist Alternative and he's published, uh, has written a number of books uh, mainly focused around uh, the history of the Australian Labor Party and the unions in Australia and all of those books are available on our bookstalls. So take it away, Tom. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, Simone. Yeah, I was just talking to Jeff earlier. It sort of seems odd to be on a panel about censorship when two of my books have recently been published by Cambridge University Press, but I'm going to press on uh, regardless because I still think that the issue of censorship and self-censorship and so forth is a very live issue, and I entirely agree with Max's uh, uh, final comments about the need to uh, smash the, uh, what is it, submissive, subordinated mush on university campuses. 
Uh, because let us start with one thing, to say that even though, yes, clearly uh, police by and large are not raiding people's studies in Australia, seizing books, nonetheless we can't overlook the situation of Bradley Manning and Julian Assange to understand how the fact that uh, police state military repression of free thought is actually still a live question in Western politics. And you only have to see Julia Gillard's uh, loyal support for Bush and then Obama uh, in the uh, incarceration of Manning, the persecution of Assange, to understand the way in which uh, the free circulation of ideas uh, is actually substantially uh, persecuted when it comes to anything close to threatening the interests of the imperialist status quo. So having said that, uh, I agree, and I think it is useful to preserve the word censorship in a form of self-censorship, but as I said, even though that is not in the form of, you know, uh, the lives of others or in a Stasi uh, basically taking people like me away and locking them up in, in Ireland prison camps for decades at a time, nonetheless, you have to review the situation of uh, non-fiction literary endeavour in Australia uh, with a very jaundiced uh, and uh, uh, very, yeah, a very, a very jaundiced perspective. Because frankly, uh, lit literary, uh, or I should say intellectual life on Australian universities is utterly barren. Um, the notion that universities are contained within themselves, the, uh, the apogee of literary debate, of political cut and thrust, has obviously never ventured down a corridor of the social sciences or humanities departments <laughs> in Australian universities. Uh, in fact, uh, desiccation, uh, conformism, uh, right-wing conservatism, subordination to the status quo, uh, lackeyism, uh, and uh, outright authoritarian practices are much more the general tenor of life in Australian universities. C. Wright Mills, this is not a new phenomenon. Uh, C. Wright Mills called university professors servants of power. Uh, and in fact, I think that is very much uh, captures the uh, role of the vast majority of Australian university academics. So I think we should distinguish, we'll start off just very briefly by talking about what the role of universities is. Uh, because despite the motto of my university being of light and learning, of light and learning, uh, they are in fact actually primarily uh, factories for the reproduction of the ideas of a status quo. There is the kind of Ivy League, the group of eight universities, uh, which uh, have uh, you know the mock uh, mock Cambridges and your mock Oxfords and uh, the Ivy growing off the buildings and all the rest of it, whose job is historically has been to reproduce the, the norms uh, and practices of the uh, ruling class and upper middle class, and then there are the more uh, uh, plebeian universities, the so-called Dawkins universities, whose main role is one basically of technical training of the lower middle class and upper working class to fit them into jobs. So essentially universities have always been about the reproduction of social elites, the reproduction of the values of uh, superiority on the part of the elite universities and subordination, but uh, technical training on the part of the uh, upper, upper and lower, so far as you use these terms, uh, tertiary institutions. Um, this factor is then, of course, reproduced within the conditions of academic life. And here I distinguish, and I, I think it's very important to distinguish between the terms and conditions that what is now actually the majority of teaching staff in Australian universities, or casualised short-term contract uh, staff, uh, and who are on three months, six months, semester-long contracts, hourly contracts, and what you might call the tenured or tenure track staff. I'm going to focus on the latter category, because them historically, like you've been responsible for, uh, setting the, the norms within Australian universities and generating uh, the majority of the uh, intellectual output. These uh, university staff in this latter category, the tenure track, are fundamentally a conservative social layer relatively well paid, uh, in, in, uh, enjoying various uh, perks, uh, research leave, uh, research accounts, a range of other things, and of course the whole norm of the master-apprentice relationship, uh, incremental progression up to the ranks, so that you can start a university as a tutor and work your way up to uh, vice-chancellor. In fact, I passed a couple of them on my way into Melbourne University this morning, vice-chancellors of uh, Melbourne University and RMIT, uh, the power couple of Australian tertiary education, uh, who uh, started life basically as tutors and lecturers at Griffith University, uh, not Oxbridge, uh, but they're now in charge of major institutions uh, worth uh, billions of dollars. And so we have an incremental progression system where there is no obvious break. I even have colleagues, I'm a senior lecturer, but lecturers call a vice chancellor by his first name. So it's not the sense of you have you know, the boss in the glass you know, office and the workers down on the factory floor. Like the public service, there is the 
uh, illusion, but not entirely illusory, notion of the fact you can start as a tutor and end up as vice chancellor. So um, this actually then goes to promote a fairly subservient, obsequious uh, ca ca uh, catalogue of uh, university academic life, uh, where reproduction of norms through the use of uh, editorial boards, uh, conference organising committees, uh, promotion committees, uh, research committees, uh, it is, is uh, guaranteed to ensure the reproduction of established ideology. Now there are, of course, radicals. Uh, and always have been radicals, small numbers in the Australian university system. But unless those radicals are also embodied, in, involved in a, a scheme of revolutionary practice, that is engagement with working class struggle outside the walls of the university, then by and large they also tend to suffer from a, a certain um, uh, abstraction. Uh, the separation between intellectual thought and practical engagement in class struggle can lead to a certain, uh, use the phrase again, desiccation or dryness, uh, uh, evacuation of the life of actual social sciences capable of engaging with the world and changing it in concert with mass struggle. And so that has basically been, in three minutes, a summary of Australian uh, intellectual life uh, for most of the last hundred years. Now, of course, that's a, I think you know, that's the basis for understanding why it is, in fact, that explicit censorship is actually rarely required in Australia. It's the point that Jeff made with which I would agree. Now, of course, there have been times when Australian you know, intellectual life has been more of a ferment. And when I look at my own shelves, when I'm looking for books about Australian social science, Australian history, Australian political economy, generally I can date the book, 1968 to about 1978. Pretty much, I mean, there are great exceptions, Robert Bollard, a whole range of, of, of people and colleagues and comrades have written books worth reading. But the breakthrough in terms of books worth reading and literature that really uh, began to make a difference and engage with people uh, was books that came out of a period, uh, literature that came out of a period when there was a social movement, when the working class was on the move, when the campuses were uh, marching with students, uh, you know, burning draft cards and the rest of it. In such a period, there was a possibility uh, for a minority of academics engaging uh, with uh, the broader social struggle to be shifted to the left, to be connected with that social struggle and therefore to be engaged uh, in a project that can actually make uh, a degree of social change so long as it, as I say, continues to be engaged with social struggle. And so when you look at Australian history, political economy and so forth, class analysis, this was a period, like at EQ, there were several courses on Marxism and political science. Now there isn't one. But again, there was a problem. Some of them were Marxists, some of them weren't. A lot of them wrote uh, quite useful uh, material that we still keep in use today. Uh, but it's also true that in many cases, and what became the downfall in a way, a degree of abstraction from class struggle. They influence, if you like, in the air. But unless those academics were also involved in a project of social change, political pra praxis, uh, then their work also tended to suffer from a certain dryness. Now, of course, we don't live in those days now, despite the fact that UQ last year we had 400 students protesting against the Liberals and running the campus and a range of other things. Australian university life has, you know, in some respect, gone back to where it was in the 1950s. A whole series of factors explaining that uh, to do with the, uh, primarily the, um, uh, the uh, downturn in class struggle, uh, the uh, sharp decline in strike rates, the sharp decline in unit militancy, and with that, the general decline in social movements of all kinds and a general shift towards conservatism uh, more prevailing in Australian society. And that, of course, uh, has a, had a very direct reaction on academics, as, who, as I started by saying, are not, by and large, radical cha challenges to authority. They're not, by and large, subversives and dissidents. By and large, they're sheep. By and large, they're submissive. Uh, by and large, they're, they feel happy in their subordination uh, and happy to subordinate when they, in turn, get the chance to do that when they become professors and vice chancellors in turn. Um, and this has taken a whole series of, of forms, uh, the uh, sort of things that Anne and others have talked about, the uh, tying of research grants to industry funding. Uh, we now have a situation where universities have whole uh, departments and committees and uh, budgets allocated to how do you get your academ academics to engage in, I forget the ARC collaboratives, linkages they call, which basically say you have to get dollar for dollar linked with some private company. And so we see a study came out later 
late last year from Curtin University or Edith Cowan uh, on 457 visas, a very topical issue. You think one would people like to know the conditions of 457 visa workers, how much are they exploited, how do the bosses use them, who funded it? The Australian Mines and Metals Association. Um, who, who funds, of course, that great inquiry into, na into international relations at uh, Sydney University, which of course is the what is it, Centre for American Studies or the United States Studies Centre, mm -hmm. and so a whole, you know. So we see in a whole range of ways the ways in which uh, research endeavour is tied up to commercial funding and the interests of corporations. And what do they call it? Industry engagement. Uh, what do they call it? Application of uh, research to commercialisation. We all have to find ways to commercialise our research these days. So you can understand if you're Karl Marx working at Melbourne University, you, you bring gas capital <laughs> along to the uh, uh, British aerospace or something. I don't think you'd be particularly interested in commercialising that. <laughs> So we have on the university campuses then a reassertion of very conservative right-wing narratives. Uh, uh, what, uh, you know, celebration of Australian nationalism, uh, the dominance of neoliberal economic thought with one or two pockets of, of resistance to that, uh, and a general decay in intellectual life. Uh, and that is then tied up with tighter control over university staff, uh, the uh, ways in which promotion and appointments are so much more tied now to a research in a specified list of journals. So, okay, we don't have a Stasi burning books here, we just have a different form of censorship, which is basically publishing those journals. You won't get sent to prison if you publish in those journals, but you won't necessarily get appointed and you won't get promoted. And when the redundancies come, your name will be first on the list because they're not approved journals. So essentially, we do have a list of approved and non-approved journals. Publish in non-approved journals and you, you, know, you don't go to prison, but nonetheless, you lose your job. So, of course, the whole direction of research now is geared towards a very narrow list, predominantly American uh, social sciences, uh, which essentially reproduce a fairly conservative mindset. So, um, what all this is kind of, I guess, heading towards, and I guess the central theme of what I've been saying then, is that we're not facing, by and large, the Bradley Manning situation. We're not facing, by and large, the Julian Assange situation. Though those things do happen, and we always need to be cognizant of the fact they do happen, and they're scandalous. But we do face a situation where in Australian university life, and this, you know, for worse, I'd say, is actually where most book proposals come from that end up on Anne's desk. Uh, is actually engaged in a massive program of self-censorship. Self-censorship by your colleagues, self-censorship by the people in authority with the university system, censorship by uh, uh, journal reviewers, uh, censorship by publishing boards. Now, Jeffrey says, well, that's not censorship. That always happens. But I think it is a form of censorship because it says what's allowable and what's not allowable. And yes, okay, I get two books published. The third book that says, oh, it's not commercial. Well, okay, well, is there censorship? No one's burning the books in Collins Street or anything. On the other hand, my books and books of other comrades and so forth are very much exception. By and large, the people are publishing challenging work in Australia these days in the political sciences and social sciences are people who are members of left groups or have been members of left groups who still bear that stamp of a training in Marxist ideas and a willingness to convert the status quo. So frankly, if I'm looking for challenging material on anything to do with Australian political economy or social sciences today, I can, I can basically find it in two or three sources. You can look maybe at the Journal of Australian Political Economy to some extent. I look at the Marxist Left Review. I look at the Links website. Basically, we're looking at publication outlets that are associated with left groups. Because frankly, if we're looking for them within the Groves Academe, we'd need an extremely powerful magnifying glass because, in fact, they're not there at all. Uh, no, that's exaggeration. There are a few that battle on. We should never forget their endeavours. But by and large, we need to smash, and I agree with Max, this... Uh, Submissive... Thank you. I'll leave it there. <laughs>